Good, good afternoon, Deb. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Well, thank you for uh, uh, to for the interview, uh, and also thank you for your interview on me um, back a couple of months ago. Uh, well, thank you for having me, and of course, that was my pleasure. It was really helpful to my audience. They enjoyed hearing from you, and I think it opened a lot of eyes. That's great. That's great. So, uh, well, we can start with uh, your experience uh, uh, with homeschooling. So when, when did you start homeschooling? Um, I started homeschooling in about 2005. Mm -hmm. um, I had, at that point in time, I had a four-year-old, I guess. I mean, so I was starting with little kids. Mm -hmm. Um, so I had a four-year-old, a two-year-old, so it was effectively preschool. And I had, um, so that I just had the two children at that time mm -hmm. in 2008, I added a third. Um, but I always knew I wanted to homeschool because of my background in teaching. And, uh, I had left in, I left public school teaching in about 1992. Okay. Uh, kept tutoring, throughout, even while I worked in the private sector. So I kind of kept my eye on it, what was happening. And, you know, I knew I wanted to be a mom someday and I wanted to sort of see what was going on. And even when I moved to North Carolina, where I live now, I still, I looked at the schools just to make sure I wasn't imagining things or, you know, and, and it just reaffirmed my decision to homeschool. So I did. And, um, I homeschooled my my two older children through third grade and first grade, respectively, and then. Um, but my youngest started in kindergarten in public school because their dad and I split, mm. and um, that was what he wanted. So oh. if both parents don't agree, you can't homeschool. Yeah, it's kind of hard, right? Yeah, and uh, so what made you uh, uh, stop teaching in school? You know, it wouldn't be truthful to say that I saw the exact things we're seeing today, but I saw the philosophy behind what we're seeing today. That is, um, I saw the teaching of reading using the Lucy Calkins style whole word reading. I saw the movement away from instructor led. I was teaching elementary school for those who aren't aware. Mm -hmm. um, but I saw the movement away from instructor-led lessons and lesson planning and a knowledge-based curriculum towards the more progressive group style learning um, away from any kind of uh, ability tracking, which was given not just a movement away from it in some instances, but a wholesale demonization of ability tracking, especially in math. And I found even as a new teacher, um, that I disagreed. I just didn't agree with the arguments being made for these changes in mm -hmm. academic focus. I found the arguments for them to be politic, well, philosophically motivated, let's just say right. ideologically motivated, not yep. research-based. So mm -hmm. I'm very much a person who wants to do what works, especially for students. I fe right. felt as a teacher, that was my obligation. And I just said, we're not doing things that work. And in fact, I felt increasingly like I was being asked to do things that demonstrably don't work. Right. And I couldn't in clear conscience do it anymore. Oh, wow. Well, I mean, I taught uh, in a private school for seven years. So mm -hmm. um, what my experience there is that uh, a lot of things come down is from the uh, from university and somehow the superintendent or principals bought into those kind of things. They always have something new. And, uh, and but teachers like us who are really teaching understand that, I mean, we can see that it, it won't work. I mean, it sounds good on, uh, on paper, but in practice will not work. But uh, I guess um, our voice was not being considered. It's always, okay, this is, this, uh, you know, fancy <laughs> way of teaching it, and uh, then you have to uh, implement it, and that got changed pretty much every couple of years. Yeah, that's true. I think a lot of parents don't realize. I think they assume that people get promoted to be principals or promoted to be superintendents away from being teachers, and for some, that's true. Some have taught, and they go into administration after. 
But what they don't realize is there are degrees you can get where you become a school administrator, that you go straight to the path of administrator, because the task of administering a school, especially in today's public school setting, but also private to an increasing degree, are more about managing money, managing personnel. It's sort of like managing a little business. And the, the skills are different enough that one could go and specialize in school administration and not ever have taught or have taught for a very short period of time, maybe as a stepping stone. And it's not exactly analogous, but I did, uh, after I left teaching, long story short, I decided to try something that had been a passion of mine. And I went to cooking school and I became a pastry chef. Mm. And as a pastry chef in a restaurant, you're not the top person, right? You're always going to work under a sous chef or a chef. Mm. And I noticed the sous chefs and chefs that I liked the best when I was working were people who had worked their way up from, you know, practically dishwasher, you know, like they had climbed their way up from like the, they, or they took pains even after cooking school to go back and work every station. Mm -hmm. So they got in touch with, you know, what is life like for you? What do you actually do? What is the on the ground situation? Mm -hmm. Those were the managers you respected. Those were the ones who really understand how everything worked, how people work together and what's effective and what isn't. And I noticed even in my administration, when I worked in a school, that was not the case. It was constantly like, this is what we were sold at the conference. This is what we were told by the people in the the universities with the PhDs and the people at the company who made the product or the people who adopted it, the board of ed, most of whom are political appointees. Anyway, this is what we're using. And you could show them data, you could show them evidence. Right. And they wouldn't like it. And, and the more you challenge, the more it compromised your ability to have a career. Right. And I saw the writing on the wall that I was not going to have a solid teaching career if I kept being me. Right. That it was sort of made clear to me. It was sort of like, you know, do you want this job or do you not want this job? You know, not in so many words, but I left before mm-hmm. it became that kind of an issue. Yeah. Well, in my case, um, our high school principal never taught in high school. She taught in um, new school, middle school, but never taught in high school. And right. but she's the one, she thinks that uh, her job is to teach us teachers. And uh, so her approach, we definitely, I mean, might work for the uh, elementary school student, but does not work for the high school students. She never had that, that kind of experience. And also at the university level, the, the, those are uh, professors and all that. Many of them actually never really taught in, uh, in, in school. And, uh, and many of them actually don't even have their own kids. So, so everything is some kind of theory and uh, they write papers about it, right? They publish in the journal and uh, then they get tenure and somehow uh, I think we still um, uh, take people uh, in universities, uh, uh, we give them too much uh, credit. Or, no, very much so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. so, so, I mean, for them, we just read to, uh, I mean, they might do some research, right? They made, uh, went to a couple of schools and practiced put those on and then, then they just write papers and then write books and, and all of a sudden they are the experts. And the, like teachers like us has been on the front line for years and we are not really being, you know, we are not really being considered as, you know, credible, which is sad. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think if there is one thing I could get across, well, there are two things I want to get across to parents. One is that you don't or you shouldn't make education policy or really any policy on based on theories. Right. Theories should always be tested. And right. the problem, and they should be rigorously tested, the problem with theories mm-hmm. in education is it's not really that ethical to test on children. Right. So if you're going to do something like that, you better design your tests so that you fail early yep. because that way you do the least amount of damage and you have a plan to adjust for the failure. But theory is not fact. And- no. So we now have, and we have for at least the last 50 years, I would say, we've been teaching within a theory. And every time it doesn't work, along comes another theory to add to the theory. And I'm not seeing within the education establishment, anybody going back and saying, where, at what point are you going to say the experiment failed? Because a theory is, if you, if you teach according to theories, you are experimenting. It's not, it's not, maybe you are, you are. 
because yeah. if they, and then so many people don't even make that connection. Theory is theory. It's not reality. Yeah. And and it has to be just like anything else scientific to tell you I have a research based theory is nonsensical. I mean, <laughs> it's like, OK, OK, but the theory is telling you where to research. Right, it's not right. saying now I'm done. Um, and the second thing I would tell parents is that because of that, and because of all the things you just said about the university professors and how most of them haven't taught, and, and many of them, if not most, don't have children. I mean, even the head of the NEA doesn't have children, not the NEA, um, the AFT does not have children, okay. Randy Weingarten. Um, parents need to value their own expertise about their individual children much more highly than they do. Right, and I also, really yeah, and that. also common sense, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think a couple of good uh, examples out there. One is uh, the phonics. They got rid of phonics. And now we have so many kids have been damaged. And now I think just a few days ago, say, oh, actually, uh, the whole world uh, kind of methodology doesn't really work. Well, and that's, you know, for 30 years, we've been saying that. At least 30 years we've been saying that. And right. I mean, that's what drove me out of the public schools. I'm like, right. Lucy Calkins does not work. It is, it, and you, you know, being Chinese, you can appreciate this. And maybe parents, I've met parents even to this day who are like, they don't do phonics in school. They don't even know that wow. they haven't taught phonics in decades or they do, do so-called blended, blended learning where the phonics comes in as like a last resort. No, no, it's the opposite. Look at the picture is a last resort. Find another word in context is how you teach poor right. readers for whom right. the phonics are not. But they've been teaching English more like how you would teach Chinese, a character-based language where you, by necessity, need to memorize shapes. Yeah. You need to memorize characters is a completely different kind of language than English. You, you have to do that with Chinese because it's not a phonetic language. Right. English is a phonetic language. The only way that you can read English words you've never seen before is to sound them out. So right. if you don't teach a child the letter sounds and it's more than 26, a lot of people think there's 26 sounds. No, no, many, many more than 26 sounds. And then our language is influenced by French and Spanish and Latin <laughs> and Greek and other and Italian. Right. And so we have versions of vowels and versions of, of consonants mm. that were from those languages that have right. come into English words. So if you don't teach the child all the letter sounds early, they don't have a strategy. They don't have a way to crack the code of words they've never seen. So the only vocabulary they have is what they've been able to memorize. Now, I don't care who, unless you are the most high IQ person around, there's a limit to how many words you can memorize. We've found that our kids, by the time they graduate high school, are tens of thousands of words behind Wow! in terms of vocabulary development, simply because they weren't taught phonics. Right. They just keep using the words they know, the words they know to write, to read. They resist reading new genre because it's too hard. They mm -hmm. resist reading things that are too challenging because it's too hard. They use cliff notes, spark notes, uh, we get audio books. And now what the schools have been doing for a better part of probably 15 years is they've been leaning into audio books because of that. They're saying, right. well, it's too hard. Why is it too hard? Because yep. you made it that way. Right. You guys failed. Your theory failed. And now you keep coming behind with worse, like band-aids right. that are just doubling down on failure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then asking for more money, right? Well, audiobooks <laughs> are expensive. So. <laughs> right. so well, yeah, I also see the trend is that there is a, a lot of uh, a lot of graphic books for, for grown-ups, which to me that is concerning. I mean, as a grown-up, you should read, right? At least is read chapter books, not those uh, right. manga style kind of graphic books. And they, they'll hide behind, you know, well, this is enjoyment, this is entertainment, and isn't it? Or in the, with the kids, aren't you happy they're reading something? Shouldn't you just be happy they're reading something? And I'm one of those rare people who says, no, I'm not actually, mm -hmm. because in some cases, I'd rather they read nothing than read some of the content that is available in the manga books and these other books, because right. the graphic novels, they will use graphic novels to, to get a lot of 
really questionable age inappropriate content into right. a classroom or into a, a library. Yeah. And we're seeing that with some of the books that are written that are not rated PG at all. Right. And yet because it's pictures, right. it should be with the kids. So they're hiding that. And then the other thing is the content is the intellectual equivalent of junk food. Yeah. Um, so would I, you know, do I want people to starve to death? No, I don't want them to starve to death. But if I'm given the choice between work a little harder and go find a vegetable versus sit there and have a steady diet of junk food and say, aren't you glad they're eating? Mm -hmm. No, I'm, I'm not going to go there with you. I'm not going to make excuses Mm -hmm. for you feeding junk food to children. Exactly. Exactly. That's a very good uh, analogy there. And uh, another uh, good example is the common cold. Right, mm-hmm. Come, they didn't really uh, experiment it um, at least to uh, the right uh, uh, extent. Then they just pushed to every school, and yes. we have seen the problem, and they just make things worse. And uh, I mean, those things should be, in a way, like you said, there is a uh, ideology behind it, so they are not really care about you know uh what is really going on has the kids learned anything or have they learned you know um have they uh be able to have the uh we keep saying that they need to have critical skills and problem skills but uh, the kids are not really getting those well you can't have problem solving skills if you're never really tasked with something a little too hard for you to do right so you know the the what what I see happening is the argument that in 21st century, in the 21st century, 21st century economy, 21st century jobs, mm. there's AI, there's technology to do all these things and people doing menial jobs are not necessary because computers can do them. Therefore, the students don't need these you know skills of reading and writing. Oh, there's a calculator, there's this, there's that. Well, I would like to tell parents that they're making your children by saying that they're making your children technology dependent. Right. So what happens when the lights go out or what happens when someone hits the kill switch or what happens when the technology breaks, who's going to fix it or who's going to operate on your tumor? Who's going Mm -hmm. to build your bridges? Who's going to do the things um, that you need done that require people who have a certain measure of know-how. And I don't mean knowing a lot of facts. I mean, understanding how the world works, who have, people who have taken knowledge and understand how that applies to a wide variety of situations, they can, they own the knowledge it's inside them. They don't need to go to a computer and look up the knowledge. It's not like, well, I'm going to go to the dictionary and look it up. If what you carry around in your head is what no one can take away from you when you're dependent on even the library. Okay. Um, And we've seen this throughout history. We've seen it, what happens when a certain segment of people own the knowledge and have access to knowledge and everybody else is dependent on them to get right. it. If you can go back to the dark ages. So it's not that I'm, you know, some old fashioned fuddy daddy. It's actually quite the opposite. I think in order to be truly competitive in the modern world, you have to be your own individual little encyclopedia. You need to have knowledge inside of you so you can be quickly adaptable. You're not dependent on anybody else. You're not dependent right. on technology to survive. And then you can survive in whatever scenario. If it's a high tech scenario, great. If it's a low tech scenario, fine. But why anyone would purposely want to tie their their kids, you know, like brain to technology is beyond me. I don't understand why anyone would do that. Well, I I have seen uh, instances, uh, uh, some mm, middle school uh, students, some high school students, I mean, they can use calculators, but they have no idea when things are way off. They just don't have that number sense. You just get a number, oh, it's wrong, I'll go back and redo it. They didn't realize that that was wrong. And now they're saying that getting the right answer is not really the point. The point is they should be engaged in math and see the wonder of math. It's like math appreciation. And um, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm really concerned that the philosophy behind all of this is it puts at as a pro, the primary value group identity group membership being part of a group and individualism is not just of a lesser value it's they're treating it almost as a sickness mm-hmm. um they're treating it as a, a vice 
to mm-hmm. want to succeed on your own. And I think that there are parents out there who still believe they're sending their children to school mm-hmm. to learn individually, to right. achieve individually, and to come out of it as a person separate and apart from anything else. And what I don't think they realize is that the values of the school are not their values anymore. Right. The value mm-hmm. of the school is we place a higher value on if your child it plays well with others. It works well in a team, um, you know, helps other people, sacri- does self-sacrifice. Are we starting to sound familiar with certain kinds of governments? Mm. So, you know, when you go in and say, but I want my child to be excellent at this or do as well as he or she can do at this skill, you're likely to have the school think like, but why would you want that? Right. Are, why are you so selfish? Why are you racist? Why are you this? Why are you that? And if I'm, I think parents, it's so dystopian. It's so bizarre for most people. They almost don't see it. It's right. like, this can't be real. Right. You don't care. Like the grade isn't the, what, and then they'll say like, what, well, so you think grades are the only thing that matters? And like, you know, that's a straw argument right. just because I think individual achievement or having a goal for yourself to compete with yourself, to be better tomorrow than you were today and so forth. Just so I, because I think that is worthy and that builds self-esteem doesn't mean I think grades are everything, you know, it's, right, like, right, it's right. obviously not, but for some kids getting a C plus in math, like for me, that was great. Cause that meant I worked really, really hard because it was not my natural subject. But if I got less than an A in English, we would wonder <laughs> because that was my core strength. Right. But I liked having that. Right. And I wonder, I sometimes think you mentioned these, these educators, they call themselves educators now, which I don't like. Mm-hmm. Um, it, I wonder if they even remember being a child themselves. Yeah. So many things they say about kids want this and kids want that. And students need this and students need that. I'm like, what robot children are you talking to? Right, I have no right. idea what they're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And also, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, one of the reasons that the parents do not uh, quite understand what is going on is that uh, in their mind, uh, school is what they had back in like 20 and 30 years ago. Yep. And the, you and I understand in the past 20, 30 years ago, things had to change you know, really dramatically. And what is going on right now is not just like, way, way different from what, like 20, 30 years ago. It doesn't help that Hollywood plays along. So if you notice, Mm -hmm. if you watch any movie in which there are scenes inside a school, Mm -hmm. it's, you never really see what's happening sort of in the classroom. It's always, they're going to school or they're leaving school or they're planning the prom or they're doing Mm -hmm. something like that. Oh, they're studying for a test. But every time I see a modern movie, I think to myself, well, that may be what school looked like in 1950, Mm -hmm. but I have been in schools recently. They don't look anything like, in fact, the only movie I've seen in the last 30 years or so that looks at all like modern school is the first half of the movie Stand By Me about Joe Clark. (laughs) I don't know if you saw that movie where he has this guy, it was based on a real person who had to go into an underperforming school. I think, um, I think it was in Pennsylvania mm. and he and he and it, they were going to close the school because they could not pass their state test okay. even with a bare minimum and the school was like a war zone mm. it was a mess and he went in there and he shaped it up with some very traditional values and some traditional rules and he was super strict and he would expel people and he did all the things that were so controversial and there were parents who said you know he's a monster he's terrible mm. he's whatever and this guy turned the school around. Now, like I said, very controversial person. Some people like him, some people don't. But that depiction of a school is much more like, especially the urban school of today, than most other things you see. I think if most parents would go and spend any time inside a school today, they would be horrified. Oh, yeah. They would yeah. sit in a class and they would wonder how anybody's learning anything. And they would, they would notice giant gaps in the students learning, um, they don't know geography. Mm-hmm. They don't, I mean, I'm talking about high school students. Right, right, right. 
if they didn't learn it at home from their parents in some kind of way, the chances are even an honor student does not know basic geography outside of the United States and even the United States, they don't know very well. Mm. Um, I had a high school senior, supposedly honor student, tell me, be surprised to find out that Alaska was not an island <laughs> because the maps they'd seen showed it next to Hawaii. You know, uh, like, I'm like, haven't you never had occasion to look, never had occasion to discuss the continents in the moon. No, just didn't discuss it. So the way they do things in these thematic units and talking about these social problems and discussing climate change constantly yeah, right. with everything is it leaves out huge gaps in general knowledge, just general stuff that parents walk around assuming my high school senior, I'm sure knows this little fact and you might just happen upon it. Do you say something to your child and they're like, what's that? And there you are looking at your A student and like, what did they teach you in school? You know, right. basic, basic things. They don't, they don't know how a car works unless again, they had a relative who showed them. Uh, they don't know, they don't know anything. I mean, like the, how the world works, how things happen that they, you don't open the refrigerator and that's where food comes from. Yeah. Um, too many people can graduate from high school and not have even the most minimal general knowledge oh yeah They'll forget definitely. it all definitely all these group projects they did the project actually one person in the group probably right. did the project they finished off they got their grade they got their pat on the head they were well behaved they graduate and uh they don't know anything they don't yeah and no. also uh just in the past 20 years uh, a huge change is on the grading system mm. uh now i mean when i was teaching uh no, I came, I was an engineer and I switched my career and become high school math teacher. So, yep. you know, way I kind of got in there, right? You kind of like you jump into a jacuzzi and if that's kind of hot. But if you're in a jacuzzi, people in a jacuzzi probably don't feel it. So right. I can like jump into that. I say, how could you do grading like this? I mean, right. the kids, uh, they get every problem wrong. They still get half percent. I mean, half the, the grade, 50%. Yeah. Exactly. And it's just like, how could you do that? I mean, in the past, they got zero, right? They got everything wrong, but not, 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 not anymore. And even you hear like stories that uh, some school, uh, even if you don't turn in homework, you still get 50%. Yep. It just like you, what you say, you could get A and Bs and you still don't really understand anything of what you learn. Right. You can just think, figure out what the teacher wants to hear or figure out the multiple choice tests. And so many things now are multiple choice or fill in the blank. Right. I have not tutored anyone, even in private school in the recent, in the last five years who has had what we call blue book tests or essay based high school exams. Mm -hmm. I have not tutored it. That's not to say they never happen. I've just said that I haven't seen them. And when I was in high school and I did go to private high school for three years, we had essay tests, but we also had them in my public high school. We had certain, it was like maybe a quarter of it was multiple choice. A quarter of it was fill in the blank and half the tests were essay questions because it's only in the essay questions where you can demonstrate that you really yeah. understood the material. So that would be an English class, history class, even science. I remember even in my biology class in high school, we had essay questions right. because in order to understand the biological processes that you had studied, whether it's photosynthesis, whether it's digestion, whatever it was, you know, checking off, five, you look, the right answer is right in front of you. Uh, guess, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. I got it right. It's right. not the same thing as understanding how it works. And I'm so grateful that I went to school when I did and that I had the kind of teachers I had um, because so many kids today are missing out. And that's, that's something else I try to get across to parents is that a lot of people you see out on the internet are focusing on what the school's doing wrong and the terrible things and the terrible ideology. And that's, I mean, we could talk about that all day, but I want parents to understand what their students are missing out on. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the bad stuff that's going in. And because they'll, there's always going to be the anecdote of, you know, no, my child has of their own mind. And then we talk about things at home and they're immune to that. And I'm like, okay, great. That's fabulous. Mm -hmm. Your child is in the minority, but okay, that's wonderful. But do you understand that your child is still getting a subpar education? Right. And in my personal opinion, that's a crime yeah, because exactly. you've got the tax money being taken or the tuition mm -hmm. you've got their childhood. 
you get one childhood right. and it's the shortest period of your life. Yep. It's the period of your life where you really don't have other obligations in terms of making a living, putting a roof over your head or taking care of aging parents or whatever your issues are going to be. Once you're an adult, you simply will never again have the amount of time to focus on learning, right. to focus on acquiring knowledge, acquiring skills, and the one that never gets discussed, developing a passion, developing your own interests, the things that bring you joy in life, the things that animate your soul. Okay. So above and beyond just, you know, I know a bunch of things and I can go have job skills, but what, how much better is the next, you know, 60, 70 years of your life going to be if what you choose for your job is something that you're very, very good at, that you want to continue to learn throughout your life. And that even if you're not making a lot of money and, you know, there's ebbs and flows and whatever you do, um, you're still basically solving problems of your choosing. Right. The things that you want to do. It's not just the skills I ended up with after I got done with this education that I was given. And so the way I describe it is your children are being robbed. Right. It is. Right in front of your face. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also uh, uh, education philosophy has changed. Yes. Uh, in the past, like 20, 30 years. And uh, uh, in the past, the, the goal of education is clear, right? We want to, so that they, uh, they have the skills that they can um, have a good career, they can have a, a, a productive uh, member of society and all that. And what changes is, uh, uh, it started in, a, in, in a higher education, the school of education or uh, teacher's college is that the goal of education changed to make social activists. Yes. And uh, when my wife went to IU Bloomington uh, doing her uh, math degree uh, in department education, no school education, and that's what uh, her professor told them just there, I mean, mm -hmm. made it very clear. Their job is to make social activists. And that's what we ha are saying, uh, mm -hmm. become more and more of that in the past uh, uh, couple of years. Exactly. And, you know, what I've been telling parents is even if you are a person who is an activist of some kind, you know, you, you know, even if you believe the world needs to have some changes mm -hmm. or we have things we need to work on in America or whatever, understand that a minor child does not have the background knowledge to make that decision on their own. And it is indoctrination. Right. I don't care what any, I mean, there's literally no way to squeak your way out of this. It is right. indoctrination to tell somebody something that is essentially an opinion is fact before they have either the background knowledge to, and skills to challenge you, vocabulary skills, reading skills, math skills, statistical understand, understanding of mm. statistics. And when you're in a hierarchical position above them in the most literal sense, the teacher, the principal, the parent, all of these people are people they know right out of the gate. They need to please in order to fill in the blank, mm -hmm. uh, in order to get a grade, in order to graduate, in order to move ahead, in order to not be singled out and embarrassed, um, in order to not be punished, in order to please and have love, whatever the reason is, if you're, you know, kind of trying to persuade a child to believe something and to be an activist to act on something you are exploiting that child right that's it's a hard truth and i don't mean to be mean but that's a fact and when you're an adult in a position of hierarchy over that person doing it by establishing an in, like a, a a strangely intimate relationship that is not appropriate in other words a peer-like relationship like mm -hmm. i'm your friend and we're, right, we're equals right, right. and that's not that is an ideological grooming right so it goes a step even beyond indoctrination. Now you're taking the child into your confidence and you're having them take you into theirs. You're, you know, you're building a kind of a relationship that their identity depends on, mm. just like with a parent. Okay. It's normal for a child's identity and sense of well-being to depend on their relationship with their parents. That's, we call that normal. We call that, you know, just biological reality. They know, you know, as a child that you're dependent on your parents for survival. But when you start making a piece of your identity dependent on the approval of the teacher, that's, that's different. 
That's right. that's not healthy. And what I'm seeing in the philosophy, the the uh, educational philosophy that you're describing, is one where instead of maintaining the boundary, teacher student, where you don't know my personal life and I don't really know yours, mm-hmm. right? And less than until it becomes absolutely necessary. In other words, the child's having a problem at home individually and it's creeping into the classroom. We might need to privately go talk to the counselor and deal with it. Right. But we are now having teachers do exercises in the classrooms, you know, about their kids' relationship with their parents, their siblings, their friends, what makes them scared, what makes them happy, that this is removing this boundary. And now anything the teacher says about anything, about politics, about government, about the environment, about the past history, is not just I'm teaching you facts or knowledge. It's, you know, believe me it's kind of like your best friend tells you something and you want to maintain the friendship right. you are less inclined to argue with them or disagree or question or whatever and because you spend eight hours a day there and not at home with mom and dad if you come home and mom and dad say well we we don't agree with that whose side are they going to take right exactly. they're putting them at odds with their support system so this is a philosophy that puts the state above the family and I think you and I talked about that in our interview that you're, you're familiar with that right. educational philosophy. And that is where we are. We are at the place where uh, it was a famous uh, quote on MSNBC host, Melissa Harris Perry said on television, very proudly back in during the Obama administration, she said, we need to get past this notion that children belong to their parents. Children belong to all of us. They belong to the community. And when we get past that, we, then we can make real change. Then right, we can right. make, and she specifically tied it to money. She said, we've never invested enough in school. And it's because we treat children as they're belonging to their parents, not to the community. They don't belong to their parents. They belong to everybody. And I would ask parents, do you agree with that? Right. Because if you don't, to, you know, the time to have dealt with that, to, to like really understand where you stand relative to your child's school is yesterday, because the community school is coming. Mm-hmm. The, the teachers are acting right now as mental health care providers and assessors. They have, they've been, they'll do it with kids as young as 18 months old. Um, the, all that data is going into a database where they're right. building towards a social credit system. We are on the fast track to being China 2.0. Mm-hmm. And that's just this China today. Um, and you know, there are people in the World Economic Forum and elsewhere who think that's fantastic. Well, it's yeah, a great but, idea. Yeah, because that they, people like that, they, uh, well, even though some don't see it, some probably don't understand it, but a lot of them, they are the new Marxists. Yes. And that's what they believe, right? When it, when you talk about like uh, 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 community or the community standard, mm-hmm. you basically, that's, the way uh, you know the the vocabulary is from communism. Uh, Absolutely, it means no longer you know uh, the core, right? The nuclear families and parents and kids and all that. Yeah, and and uh, and uh, also you talk about uh, the the teachers and talking encourage the student talk about their personal life and all that. And also we say teachers now, they also tell the, the kids about their sexual orientations and their, mm-hmm. you know, LGBTQ like uh, uh, lifestyle and all that. And uh, and we see that, right? There's an uptick of uh, young girls wants to change their, uh, uh, their, I mean, they want to change their uh, gender and become, you know, and at right. that age, that's just really, really dangerous. Right. And there's there's two things that are wrong with that. The first I've sort of hinted at already when I said that, you know, uh, it's destroying the appropriate boundaries between adult and child that need to be there to respect the integrity of the family, first right. of all, but also the child. Children are not miniature adults, and they need to be able to come into an acquaintance with adult topics like sexuality at their own individual pace. There is a giant difference between mm-hmm. teaching the mechanics of reproduction, for example, to you know, hopefully fend off you know, pregnancy or disease, things like that. There's a big difference between teaching like the biological mechanics of how all that can happen so they can be protected and teaching 
sexuality as a source of, you know, pleasure and this and that and the other. Right. We were talking about minor children. We were talking about kids who come to a, 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 an interest and or comfort with that at wildly different ages. Some kids are comfortable having conversations like that with just about anybody in eighth grade. Other kids are not going to be okay with that till they're 17 or eight. They just don't, and maybe they could talk to their friends about it, mm. but strange adults like right. you, I mean, I have three children, all teenagers. And if you ask each of them, they would tell you they were at a totally different age right. when they were remotely comfortable having people talk about this around them, mm. never mind to them, with them, with their peers sitting in the same room in a mixed group, boys, girls, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. when I tell them what's going on in the, in the schools with the stuff, they're like, I mean, that's why I say they don't think of the kids. They assume because they want to talk about it because the adults, these narcissistic, honestly, I believe they're narcissistic people because they want to talk about it. Surely the kids want to talk about it. No, they don't. Maybe a tiny handful do. Most of them are just sitting there terribly uncomfortably right. going, oh my God. So there's that. And then the second piece of it, as you pointed out, is the social contagion that you're, you're taking something that really is a very personal, we were told, inborn thing, right? We're told, you know, you're born this way, whatever. Okay. Well, if that's true, why do we have recruitment going on for gay straight Alliance clubs as young as kindergarten? Why do we have the, why do we have an uptick? Each generation is increasing its self-reporting of who's LGBT, whatever, by 30%. Each generation, Bill Maher did a whole routine. He said, well, right. by that, by that measure, by 20, I think it was like 20, 30 something, we will all be gay. Like he said, you know, he was literally draw, doing a thing because it's utterly ridiculous and obviously in inorganic to have this level of growth when something is being talked about constantly, 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 that's unorganic. That is a fad. That is a trend. Right. That yeah. is a social contagion. And also, very obvious. yeah. And uh, uh, what is very scary is that uh, schools, some schools actually was doing that. Uh, without parents' uh, consent, even without parents' awareness, they took their, uh, you know, preteen girls and to have those hormone kind of blocker yeah. treatment and all that. They just like that is just child abuse. Yeah, it's it it is child abuse. Um, it 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 ought to be medical malpractice. It ought to yeah. be many many things. I mean, you can't take a child to get their ears pierced without their parents' consent. Um, this is something, and a lot of parents aren't aware of it, but these are puberty blockers will destroy their bone density. They right. will be permanent children physiologically. They'll be sterile. There are all these problems. This is not, this is not only not benign, this is incredibly damaging. Exactly. And the schools, the fact that the schools are participating in this, I, I sit there every day and I think to myself, why aren't parents storming, storming the, the capitals of their States with pitchforks and torches? Mm -hmm. Because this is really disturbing. And now that they're having the screeners come into the schools with a psychological profiling and they're having, they want to do community schools with a health center right on site. So the kids don't even have to leave the building to get them. Um, I'm seriously concerned that parents who continue to use the schools thinking, well, I'll just deprogram them when they come out. And, and what if, what if you don't, what if you can't, We've already heard a few stories of students being or kids being taken from their parents by social services simply because the parents were suspected of not supporting the transition. So the case, the famous one in California, uh, this girl Yaley, or that was her name, and then she became something else. Uh, uh, she became, um, I can't remember what, uh, Draco, I think, as a boy. And the mom was Catholic. And so the school decided that because the mom was Catholic, surely she won't agree with this. And they referred the kid to be removed from the home and put in a group home. So she was put in a group home and was not allowed to see her mom except supervised visits very rarely. And this was a girl who was depressed before she transitioned. So she never got the care she needed. She never got mm -hmm. the care for depression. They trans socially transitioned her at school. Then they began to medically transition her. And the tragedy of the story is because her de depression obviously didn't get better because it Right, her right. problem wasn't what they said it was. She committed suicide. Wow. And she's, you know, just one of several. So um, this is this is a when when the schools have decided that they own your kids or that your kids are property of the community, they mean it. Right. It's not just an expression. It's not just it takes a village. It's it takes a village and you're not part of it, mom and dad. Um, it, the villages 
you know, more, like I said, it's more like Mao's sense of a village or it's more like yeah. that. And it, it's, uh, it's happening right in front of our faces slowly and it's disguised. And we're told when we ask questions that we're getting misinformation. So we're lied to. Right. Um, and it, it really makes me sad. Right. And, and the, uh, one of the things that uh, most parents uh, don't realize, uh, and uh, I didn't know this uh, just a year ago, is that the communism, the Marxism has taken over our higher education. Yes. And, and especially in the uh, uh, school education or teacher's college. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and that's what we see people like that. They, they, it doesn't matter if it's, uh, it's a teacher went to college or maybe a superintendent went to some kind of program. They had been indoctrinated in right. that kind of thinking. So that's why they really believe, uh, you know, when they say that the, uh, the children belong to the community, they, they really believe that. Yes. Um, I actually, as you mentioned that, I have right next to me, the Pennsylvania Gazette. This is the magazine of my alma mater for grad school, the Graduate School of Education at the University of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And I open it up and I find right inside this article, Constitution, Constitution revised. revised. And it says, Thomas Jefferson thought every generation should change the nation's fundamental law. That's not what he said, but okay. A new book imagines how that might've played out. Mm. And so they're going through like, hey, should we change the constitution? So people are broadcasting what they want or what they'd like to do. And the problem is that people are not listening. Right. They're not listening to what the people, what people are saying. Um, you know, then the, here's another one, the hunger to end hunger. Okay. The, the hunger to end mm. hunger. Okay. And then they say, you know, as the head of the largest hunger relief organization in the Philadelphia region, this guy's passionate about rooting out food insecurity, food. But I was looking at a site yesterday. So, you know, here was this whole like collective responsibility for everybody eating. Right, right, right. Mind you, we're already paying for food, you know, EBT cards for people who make up to $42,000 a year. I mean, I don't make $42,000 a year, but I don't get EBT card, mm. but there is a website and it is called, and I highly recommend it. It's called gapminder.org. Gapminder. Gapminder.org. Now it mm. is global. It talks about the world, but it has a bunch of quiz questions. It's based on statistics, actual real life statistics with no agenda, just the math. And it quizzes you on what percentage of the world is actually food insecure, like does not have food or what percentage does not have clean water, et cetera, and so mm. forth. And the vast majority of people get these questions wrong. Right, right. So not only are the universities pushing this like, oh, it's so, the world is so bad. And we have to do all these things uh, to convince you to be Marxist because mm. we have plenty, so we should be guilty, but they're lying. Yeah. They're straight up lying about the degree to which people are living in dire poverty who are food insecure. Look around at how many overweight people there are. Yeah. Exactly. And think about what starvation really looks like. Right. And you will see that the number of people in this country who are truly hungry is almost no, they're probably the homeless people. Mm -hmm. They're probably people who are homeless and even they have shelters and places right, they can right, go right. to get food. So they're using our goodness. Yep. They're using that Americans are one of the, the most generous, caring, uh, philanthropic, charitable populations of people on the planet and have been for some time. And it's, to me, the proof that we're not racist, the proof that we're not stingy and selfish and all these things is the very fact that the worst thing you could do is call someone a racist. If that's the scarlet letter, that you're not really a very racist country, are you? Because if you were and somebody called you racist, you'd be like, and what's your point? Mm -hmm. But the fact that it's like a dagger in your heart, right. you, know, oh, you, oh, be, you know, and um, it, then the same thing goes for tugging at our heartstrings about hunger, about, you know, this and that and the other, when in fact, the real, the real hunger that we have in this country is for meaning the real poverty we have is for virtue 
Right. Um, and the things that are missing from our children's education, you know, the most is character. And then they'll turn around and lie to you and say, social emotional learning programs are teaching character. And I'm thinking the same people who got rid of a grading system, who don't expel violent children, violent mm -hmm. offenders from the school and allow them to continue to abuse other people because reasons, nobody knows why, um, or racial equity or something. Right. I, I don't think you're teaching my child character. No. I don't think you're teaching my child about virtue because I'm not seeing you display it. No, no. It has to be modeled. Character is not taught in a, in a lesson. Yeah. It's not, it can be reinforced through lessons. It yep. can be reiterated, but it, you know, like, but you cannot straight up lecture character at somebody. You have to model it and you have to demand it. It's the kind of, there's some things you only learn by doing. And I would say being a good person is one of them and having the pushback and boundaries against you. And that's what raising children is about. Right. Raising children is about taking them from the raw state where they are little narcissistic beings, little toddlers, me, 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 and bringing them gently and lovingly into an acquaintance with the appropriate boundaries of you end here and other people begin here and you want respect from them. You need to respect them too. And this is yours and that is theirs. And that, you know, and you gently bring them along into these things through common sense rules, the golden rule, don't, don't hurt other people, don't steal their stuff. And parents do that. Right. School doesn't do that. No. School is supposed to reinforce what parents presumably already did. Now, you'll get the argument, the parents aren't doing their job. They're not doing it. They mm. sent their kids to daycare. You give them a blah, blah. Like, yeah, the consumer society really did kind of push us into daycare, didn't they? But yes, parents are supposed to do it zero to eight. After eight years old, you're playing catch up, but it's still not going to be the school. You can, they, they have other things to do. You, mm -hmm. you can't squeeze that in. This is, a, this is a daily loving job that gets done. And honestly, it really does get done best by people who love you because for you, to incorporate a lesson as important as how to be a good person, mm -hmm. you need to be taking it from someone that you trust implicitly and that you believe has your best interests at heart, that they're not exploiting you or using you. Right. Okay. And that tends to be a family member, not always, but tends to be. So I think the schools are claiming they have to take over parenting from us. And we look, it's an anecdotal thing. Like see that kid, foster kid over there. You see the kid who has lousy parents. Well, because of that kid, we have to treat all the kids like they have lousy parents. Right, right. Well, I'm speaking to those of you, the vast majority of you who are good parents, mm -hmm. or uh, let's put it this way, doing the best you can parents, right. okay? Which is really good. Um, you guys need to speak up for yourselves. You need to stop taking that as a given that your child needs the school to parent them. No, they don't. Your child has you. Right. Well, this is one thing, um, especially as my experience growing up in China, is that most people uh, don't, in a way, uh, don't understand that there are people who can just lie to you in your face. And, and especially, in, well, I, I think what we see in the, in the COVID, and that actually gave us opportunity, and also... Uh, parents showed up to the school board and, you know, and hear the uh, board members and the, the uh, superintendents. And now it's become clear that those people, they just lie to you. Right. They have no, no problem lying to you. But for most of us, that was a problem, right? right? For most of us, it's hard for us to lie or at least knowingly to lie, right? But we understand that politicians had no problem, but the thing is, uh, the super school board members and the superintendents, administrators, they had no problem either. They can just lie yeah. to you. Right. Mm -hmm. it beca it's because of their fundamental values. So, and think about it this way. If you really believed, and there are a lot of true believers amongst these people, if you really sincerely believed that you were doing the right thing by these children and their parents were not, or their mm -hmm. parents were in the way, mm -hmm. wouldn't you lie? You know I mean? So like, in other words, 
you, you know, there are obviously they're bad actors. There are bad right. actors who are self-motivated for venal reasons and they, they make up a percentage. Then I think you have the innocents. I don't want to call them innocent because they really ought to know better. They ought to, to get their own evidence mm. who are, have a job and they're not very deep thinkers. We're not really putting our best in teaching. I'm sorry to say, but we're not. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they don't think very deeply and somebody comes along and they say, here, this is what we're doing. And this is the teaching method. And this is important. And oh, by the way, the research says somebody with a PhD said this, mm -hmm. they're like, okay. And so they think they're doing the right thing and they do their job. They just don't even question it. Mm -hmm. They're just, and then you have the other category mm -hmm. where I call the true believers. And there are many more of them than you think there are. Right. And these are the ideologues. These are the people who've been taught in from college, probably even high school onward, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. nothing matters more than the, than the socialist goals. Nothing right. matters more than equity. Nothing matters more than social justice. Nothing right. So in other words, individual parents, individual children, all that is noise to them. Mm. They don't see individual humans anymore. Right. They see comrades. They see cogs in a, in a bigger picture that is part of their revolution. So they have, they have a pseudo reality utopia that they're pushing for. And once you create like that, you know, James Lindsay talks about this. Once you have right. the pseudo reality, you have to have a pseudo logic mm -hmm. because otherwise your arguments fall apart. And then you have to have a pseudo morality that's based on your pseudo logic. Otherwise your entire worldview falls apart. It's a house of cards um, because what they're describing is not reality. Re Utopia is not possible. You right. can't control millions of people. So, but they dearly want to, they don't like reality. So they do that. But I think, you know, we who want to live in reality and are comfortable with that have to start calling their bluff. Right. We have to, it doesn't matter. I tell parents all the time, it doesn't matter why they're lying. It doesn't matter whether it's malicious, by accident, religious level of belief system. It's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. All you need to know is they cannot back up their claims with evidence. Mm -hmm. They cannot tell you with any kind of proof that this will definitively cause this for your student that is a good thing that you want. And because of that, you should not let them do it. So you, you really shouldn't, you wouldn't let the school diagnose a medical problem mm -hmm. for your kid. You mm -hmm. wouldn't let them say, well, you know, your child has a uh, bone cancer or whatever. Why would you let them diagnose mental health or emotional yeah. health problems? Yeah. Why would you let them, you know, you wouldn't let them make decisions about so many things for your kids. Why let them decide what they should learn? And people say, well, but it's always been that way. School always decides what they should learn. Well, let's go back to your common core thing. Mm -hmm. Most parents don't understand that common core was about creating a common set of what they called standards, mm -hmm. but they redefined mm -hmm. the word standards to do it. When we were kids, a standard was student will be able to do X mm -hmm. student will know Y. Mm -hmm. And by demonstrative output, like I can do this math problem. I understand mm -hmm. my multiplication. I know my multiplication tables. These standards were more about what the teacher was going to present to the students. The teacher will cover this. Teacher will present that. Right, student right, will right. be exposed to this. Right. Well, that leaves a lot of leeway, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't ask, it doesn't give you rubrics for what the student will know and what the student will be able to do at the end of the year. And teachers, good ones, initially were like, well, what do I do with this? I don't know how I'm even going to measure my success or how you're going to measure my success. And it very quickly became a game of how many ways can I perform? Mm. How many ways can I show you with things on my bulletin board and PowerPoint presentations and group activities that look, I'm exposing them to this topic. And the kids might've walked out of there, not knowing anything about what they were exposed to, right. but the person who could do the coolest PowerPoints or the, the neatest classroom decoration or whatever, they checked the box of met the standard, the common mm. core standard. They presented it. Same with the, 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 the people who wrote the textbooks. Suddenly you could write a textbook with ideology all in there. Right. You could write it. You could write lessons that was all about your particular political point of view because the kid wasn't going to need to demonstrate they knew any of it when they were done. Mm -hmm. You could expose, as long as you said Expose them to U.S. history and the U.S. Constitution. Okay, we're going to talk about how bad it is. Right. Like you know, they don't. They're not. And it's not like student will be able to recite the preamble to the Constitution and will know the first ten articles of it. 
That's what it was when I was a kid. Mm. Now it's just there. We're going to talk about it. Right, right. So what Common Core did was it was the final nail in the knowledge based curriculum. It opened the door wide to ideological approaches to teaching, to you know, wide variations in styles of presentation and lesson plans. You could get away with literally phoning it in or sticking a kid on a Chromebook and claim you'd covered the topic and then teach to the test for the last month and a half. And the tests were also dumbed down and made easier. Oh, yeah. And you could, you know, wash your hands of it, collect your paycheck and go home. Now, good teachers like you, and I like to think like I was, we don't want any part of that. Right. We're looking at this going, I'm not a factory worker and I'm not a lazy bum and I'm not an ideologue. Mm -hmm. So if I don't fit into any of these categories, I don't belong in a public school because right. this is an insult to my intelligence, an insult to the children's intelligence. It's a lie to the parents because the parents are like, you're teaching them to read and write and do math and everything, right? And the teacher's like, uh-huh, <laughs> they're not. And no. when I've asked teachers, well, when are they learning grammar? Well, they just, you know, they pick it up. They pick it up when they uh, read the, the readings. And I'm like, nobody ever picked up grammar. You don't just pick it up. Mm -hmm. It's not organic. You know, right. oh, where do they learn spelling? They have a spell check. If you really point blank ask them, they'll tell you. Mm -hmm. They'll say, yeah, we don't do that. Wow. But parents just assume. Right. Yeah. I mean, that is really the, the, the problem. The parents... First of all, parents assume that uh, everything's going as they are being told, especially by the administrators. And then they assume that things still was like back like 20 and 30 years ago. Exactly. I mean, yeah, just like but you imagine, said. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, but I want anybody watching this to understand that I have nothing but compassion for you oh, as yeah. a parent. If you have a child older than five, Okay, so notice your child's been in school for some period of time and maybe they're doing very well. In other words, maybe they get A's or maybe they're coming home and like, look, mommy, what I did, whatever. Um, and you might be thinking like, I don't want to believe that. I mean, most people are hardwired not to believe that they've been an unwitting participant in any harm coming to their child, even if it's minor harm, okay? Um, the second thing is, imagine you now have to sort of face your teenage child and think to yourself like, oh my God, how do I turn this ship around without mm -hmm. incurring the wrath of my child? Right. So whether the child's doing well or not well on the books, you know, they've got A's or whatever, you still got the same problem. Ironically, the people who have kids who are doing very poorly, the kids who are failing or the kids who are miserable, the kids who are bullied, the kids who are like coming home with anxiety attacks, you try to pull your kid out of school, they're more likely, like, thank you so much. Oh my God, you know, I'm out, you know, whatever. And they'll be happy. The kid who's like on the football team mm. and they've got, they're on the honor roll and they're getting A's and all this. And you start looking at their work and you realize it's superficial right. and they really don't know much. Mm -hmm. And they're 16 years old and they're vacant. Like they just, they know very superficial knowledge of things and they really don't think very deeply or they no. never read a book except what they're asked to read right. and you suddenly realize oh my god that's I, my heart breaks yeah because i honestly people ask me what do i do and i'm like well in that case i i i don't know except to encourage that child to deepen their knowledge, recommend books to them, you know, show them start with videos. I've known people have had success where they'll show for example like Jordan Peterson mm. videos to a teenager mm -hmm. and to do it as like to ask their opinion. Right. Like you know, I'm curious. I've discovered this guy and I don't know if you heard of him and I thought this was pretty interesting. I really want your opinion on this. So they feel like, "Oh, you want my opinion, right?" Mm. And sometimes you can break through like that. Um you can also incentivize them, straight up bribe them. Like, yeah. read this book and I'll give you a hundred bucks, but I really <laughs> want your opinion on it. I know you're not inclined to read it, but I really want you to read it and talk to me about it. You might be able to do that, but you can't just go to your kid who's probably older than 12 and say like, oh my God, you know? Um, you, I mean, some kids you can, but you have to know your child. But the more successful in this current school they are, the harder it's going to be for parents to believe that this isn't good. And for the kid, the kids are gonna look at you like you have three heads. What, mm. what are you talking about? I'm an honor student. Right. I'm, a, I'm the captain of the football team or whatever. And I'll, you know, I don't, I don't know what to say. Hopefully 
There's some meat there. There's some knowledge there. It's not too late. A lot of people I've met a lot of adults who somewhere in their twenties, they kind of, the light switch went on Mm -hmm. and they realized like, Oh my God, I missed a lot in school. Like what happened? Right. Right. You just have to be very encouraging about that. Encourage them to take time off before college though, no matter how well they did in school, because that year, if they take a gap year, that's usually the year where they figure it out. Right. When they go in the real world, they, that's when they go, oh, wait a second. What? Mm. <laughs> if they go straight to college, it could just be four more years of delay for getting acquainted with the fact that they've been in suspended animation as far as emotional and, and intellectual maturity. And then they get out and now they're 21 and that's a lot harder road. Oh yeah. And uh, especially a lot of people goes to college and uh, they, I mean, the college has been already controlled by the uh, by marxists yeah and so they yeah. once they graduate from college they don't learn any real life skills but they have all those ideas that the society is wrong the society is unjust that I mean they they want to have a right. yeah so i think encouraging your child unless your child is one of those who is and there are kids like this who are truly scholars. Mm-hmm. In other words, they they have public school or not, they have taken extra classes outside of school and they are mm-hmm. hard. They're like, I want to be a doctor. I want, I want to be a neurosurgeon. Uh, I want to, you know, right. or I want to be an engineer and I know yeah. I want to do that. Like if that, if they have goals like that, then college is the way to go. Just try right. to encourage them to go to one that's not as woke. Okay. Not the yeah. Ivy League. Don't, don't, don't go to the Ivy League. Um, yeah. There are better schools for your money. But the the kids who are like, isn't that the natural thing to do after 12th grade is to go to college, but I really don't know what I'm majoring in. No. Yeah. I mean, not just a, maybe not definitely not do everything in your power parents to discourage them from doing that. Take yeah. a gap year, right? Make it worth their while, like yeah. somehow financially make it worth their while to stay out because that year they need that year to grow up some yeah, emotionally and, and psychologically yeah they and need also it. just find a job right work for yes, a year and work. see see what what's what's his real life real world is like yeah exactly exactly yeah. they the may thing? find they don't need to go to college right right I mean, they may find they don't need to i can't tell you how many people i know who did that and they either went to college incrementally as they needed the extra learning to move up the ladder in right. their job. I know a nurse who did that mm-hmm. and now she's doing very well and she has no school debt. And I also know people who just realized after a, a year of working, not in fast food, but like they got a job in a field, right, like right, almost right. internship. And they realized they were able to learn what they needed on the job. And then by demonstrating, they were four years ahead of their peers. Mm-hmm whether it was in writing code and building, you know, doing technology, even where my husband works right now at Duke Duke Power, they have now finally gotten rid of the four-year degree requirement Mm -hmm. because they're realizing some of their very, very best people don't have it. They taught themselves or they went to like a boot camp or they did something different and they are more mature and they are just hit the ground running. A lot of what they're teaching as far as computer science and engineering, whatever in college is very antiquated. It's backwards. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. yeah. And the people who are out doing are very far ahead. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So. Well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, You're so welcome. And we didn't get time to talk more. I mean, we hope we can do not, uh, do one more next time. Okay. Sure. Yeah, talk about like your experience with homeschooling and the, uh, uh the 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 service you provide you you provide and also your your channel uh, yeah well you, i mean everyone can find my videos um on my channel the reason we learn and yeah um I, just like here in this interview mostly what i do is try to educate parents and coach parents and and help them find their own voice and their own power um in this to so they can uh, take hold of educational freedom you have it you just have to use it right and another thing I like to say to parents is that, like, they were scared, like, uh, I don't know what to do. I can t- um, always tell, tell them that you cannot do worse than the no. public education. You'd in have most to work cases. hard at it. You'd yeah. have to really work at it. Right. <laughs> I mean, seriously, yeah. you can put your kid in front of documentaries all day and feed them healthy meals and tell them to go outside and play for an hour in, in between here and there, mm-hmm. and you'd be way ahead of the game. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Well, thank you very much.
You're very welcome. Yeah. Bye. Bye.